I'm Larry Lenville, Major Frank Burns from MASH, and you're listening to The Ken Barron Show on WJBC. And what a thrill it is to talk with the uh, gentleman who created the TV show, MASH. Larry Galbart, good morning. Good morning. What a thrill. One, two, one Larry after another. Yes. <laughs> Larry Lenville is just such a nice guy. I hope he's doing well. He had a little... uh, he's, he's doing well. I just heard from his wife. Uh, radiation treatments are, are, are finished. She said he's fine, except he, he glows in the dark. She's pretty funny about it. <laughs> He's a. Uh, in fact, you you kind of had a fondness for the whole group, didn't you? The whole Mash cast. Uh, yes, but not in the past tense. I I still do. You know, they're very much um, a part of my life still. Yeah. yeah. McLean Stevenson, of course, was from uh, Bloomington, he, and uh, he certainly was. We we used to make note of that from time to time. Exactly. He wore the uh, well, the Illinois sweatshirt in many cases. And yep. Yep. Made references. Made references to Bloomington. Larry Gelbard is such a talented guy, I don't know where to begin other than to tell you he has a new book out called Laughing Matters, and it's a great book. It's, I was reading this last night, and uh, what, how insightful. You, you really do love to do the wordplay. When you saw Alan Alda do the, uh, the Groucho Marx uh, type of delivery, uh, that's all wordplay, isn't it? Well, it, it, there's, also, there's also a quality in Alan's voice, which is, is, which is Groucho-like to me. Uh, he, I never mention that a lot to him because Alan is a is a serious actor. I mean, he takes his acting seriously, and, and I, I don't think he wanted to be uh, thought of as someone doing an impersonation of someone, you know? But, but I mean, you can hardly watch it without thinking of Groucho anyway, can you? I could hardly write it without thinking of Groucho. <laughs> and you deliver it just like Groucho might say it. <laughs> well, listen, you start watching Marx Brothers films when you're about six years old, and it, it gets into your bloodstream. Yeah. You made a comment in the book that said, uh, what would life be like if I had done my studies instead of gone to see the Marx Brothers and all the great ones? Exactly, exactly. Woody Allen talks about thinking his mother looks like Groucho Marx. That's how much it affected him. <laughs> unless, unless, of course, she has a mustache and a big, bushy eyebrows and smokes a cigar. Yeah. I, uh, I saw the, uh, the interview that you guys did with the uh, show of shows. Uh, all, uh, all the, your, the Caesars writers. The Caesars writers. Yeah. Yeah. And... Um, Man, it was great to see you all. You guys just comparing notes as to what happened to you in those days. But your career goes back uh, so far. I don't know where to begin with all this. As a matter of fact, I want to bring it all up. Let's let's talk about Mash though while we're at it. Okay. Sure. Uh, the the movie had been out first, and uh, first the book. Uh, well, first the book, then the movie, then the TV show. Yes. And uh, I think a lot of people sort of sat around and thought, how in the world could you turn that into anything that could be seen, you know, on a half hour basis, week after week after week? But you did a great job. Well, I think. I think the most satisfying jobs are the ones that people say, you know, can't be done, really, including yourself, in a way. You know, you have faith that you can do it, even though you may not have all the, you know, the answers yet to the questions that are bound to arise as to how to do it. Yeah. Um, when you killed off McLean Stevenson's character, uh, yes. you talk about that in the book. Everybody had everything but, I think, the last page of the script. Uh, the actors uh, rehearsed and shot the show not not knowing that there was one more page that we would film at the end. And that was when Radar came in and announced that uh, Henry Blake's plane had gone down. In the Sea of Japan, there weren't no survivors. Uh, the, the reason for that is we weren't being coy or, or you know, cute about it. We, we thought that if, we knew that if the actors knew that the character was going to be dead in the last scene, that it would affect how they played all the scenes leading up to it. Mm -hmm. We didn't want them... Uh, even giving a hint in their performance that they knew tragedy was ahead. And um, I think that was the first time it was ever done in a comedy. A comedy yes. show where a character was killed off. I believe so. A lot of people thought that was just to uh, maybe spite McLean Stevenson for giving up on such a great show. And that wasn't the case at all, really, was it? Well, you know, I'm not going to be such a goody two-shoes and say it wasn't the case. It, it certainly wasn't the dominant. I, I think we were all upset that McLean was leaving. But there was no sense, in, no, no, no sense of... Uh, revenge or saying, oh yeah, take this as a party shot, you know. Mm -hmm. we, we did want to make the point that in, 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 in real life, in real wars, people you care very much about do die. And uh, that was the case. I think everybody took it pretty hard. <laughs> uh, including McLean. He, he watched this film that last page and he was so, so really uh, emotionally um, Involved that he went to his dressing room and, and cried for a couple of hours. I, I didn't find out about that until much later. And I was very sad to hear it. Yeah, I saw him shortly before he died. He came back to do a benefit for the normal theater here in town. Yes, and he talked about that. He said, "I always thought the people were in love with with McLean Stevenson." He said they were in love with Henry Blake. Well, uh, I love Mac, but he he got it wrong. They were in love with they were in love with McLean. Uh, they they loved him a good deal, and. Uh, um, I think you're right. I think they did. They did, of course. You know, because 
There was no Henry Blake, or the, I mean, there was a Henry Blake in the movie, of course. Uh, Roger Bowen did a wonderful job doing that, but, but it was McLean's way that, that, that people found so attractive, and, you know, to this day, I rue the fact that he, you know, couldn't, uh, or wasn't advised to stay with it and, and realize the maximum potential, you know? Right. Uh, we're talking with Larry Gelbart about MASH. There were several firsts with that show, uh, multi-tiered level plots, I guess, as you yes. describe it. Uh, yes, four or five stories running at the same time. And also letting the uh, the actors sort of write the dialogue for you at one point when you did the uh, show about the interview. Just once, yes. Uh, yes, that was a combination of improvised lines and lines that they wrote and then lines that I wrote and then lines that we wrote together. It was a, a very unusual way to do a show uh, then and, and would be even now. I mean, uh, not many people will sort of work without a net like that in, in, or, you know, in network broadcasting or... or able for that matter. Right. And to actually do a show and have it in the can before they see the script, that was an unusual thing, too, you said. That was revenge. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking with Larry Gelbart back in a moment on WJBC. More protection plus a proven yield advantage. More protection, more yield for six bucks less. It's not your everyday offer, but it's not your everyday protection. See your Cyanamid AgriCenter dealer for details. Always read and follow label directions. Hey, this is Bob Hope, and you're in tune with the Ken Barron Show. Larry Gelbart worked. In fact, you wrote for Bob Hope for a good uh, good while, didn't you? I'm still writing for him. <laughs> I, I just did a piece for TV Guide uh, celebrating probably an issue that will probably celebrate his 95th birthday, and I'm going to Washington to be part of the uh, Library of Congress salute to him as well. You've had such a long career. You'd say that uh, back in the early days, Hope would give a call to the writers. You'd all get on a plane, never knowing for sure where you'd have to be writing. You might be writing in a plane in a hotel room or wherever. Very often. Very often. Any part of the world. Yeah. You know, there's been some criticism of Bob Hope. He's he's a little more distant uh, than some other people who were really warm, I think. But um, well, uh, you, have, you have good things to say about him in your book. The man's 95, <laughs> you know. He's, he's gone through several changes uh, over the years. Uh, he's done some popular things, some unpopular things. Uh, I only remember good things about Bob. It's not as though I'm, I'm being Pollyannish about it or, 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 or whitewashing him. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm remembering it in the, the way it was then, and it was, it was wonderful. You, um, I don't know how many people wrote, but Bob Hope went through a lot of writers over the years. Did he? He not? did absolutely. A lot of people went through Bob Hope too. Yeah. You talk, <laughs> you talk about Jack Benny. I'm told that Benny paid his writers more than say Hope did, and they were loyal or, or more loyal, more loyal. <laughs> I like loyaler. Loyaler <laughs> uh, stayed with him longer. Uh, you have any thoughts about that? Any comments? Uh, I, I will say this. I, I, I'm, I don't. I don't really mean to come off as a Hope apologist. Mm -hmm. uh, this thing, there are things he's done, you know, with which I disagree. But um, when I worked for Bob, no one paid higher prices, including Benny, who was really generous with his writers. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hope would never fire anybody uh, or have somebody do it for him. It was not one of those show business things, you know, good cop, bad cop. Uh, it was just not. The, there was a time when he was very disrespectful of writers, but but he, as I said, he's gone through many phases. And when I finally got to work for him, and I worked for him for four years. Right. He was a doll. Yeah. I guess I'm thinking of the Arthur Marks book that came out. Uh, not very uh, not very complimentary. No. Um, Jack Benny. Thoughts about him? I, I, the, I never worked for Jack Benny on a regular basis. But I you have write, him in your book, don't you? I, I do write about him in the book. And Milton Berle. And, and Milton Berle, who I never worked with either, but we're very close friends. Uh, George Burns, who I, I did work together, obviously, on Oh God, and, and Danny, Danny Thomas, uh, who gave me my start. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, uh, you know, if you're going to write comedy, uh, there's no better way to learn than, than working for the masters. Where, what was the highlight of your uh, your whole career? Do you have one? Would it be MASH? I or? hope it's next Tuesday. <laughs> I like that answer. I like that. <laughs> it must have been nuts, though, writing with uh, with people like Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner and folks like that. It was that. nuts. That was the whole idea. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was kind of inspired nutsiness, though, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was tremendous. It, it certainly was a highlight. I've, I've had... I, I, I don't. I don't have one highlight. I really should. Have, you know, I have a highlight reel. I've, I've done some things with that that are, you know, in retrospect, even then, were remarkable. Right. We're going to be back in a moment. Larry Gelbart's on the line. If you want to talk to him, you know the number eight two nine two three four five or one eight hundred three two two nine three seven seven. We believe so strongly in the relay for life. So if you'd like more details, phone four five two twenty eight twenty two. That's four five two twenty eight twenty two. You're listening to the right radio station. 1230 WJBC. 
Hi, this is Carl Reiner, and we are lucky because we are tuned to the Ken Barron Show. And uh, when we hear from Carl Reiner, we think of, uh, oh God, I think, because he directed it. We yes, think, he did. We think of a lot of other things, I suppose. We think of Carl Reiner, going back to the Sid Caesar show. Um, but how do you describe Carl Reiner? Must have been, uh, must have been a great collaboration when you were working on Oh God, huh? Carl, well, Carl is uh, Carl has a kind of a curious, restless mind, and, it, and he, it's it, it's a pleasure to be around. Uh, there's never a dull moment with Carl, never. Yeah, I was telling you this off the air. I saw Oh God, and uh, I tell you, chills went up my back at the final line that George Burns utters as as God in that movie, which is which is uh, John Denver says to him, uh, "You're leaving. Will I ever talk to you again, or something like that?" And George Burns says, "I'll tell you what. You talk, and I'll listen." Yes, it was lovely. It really was. And he goes walking and then disappears. You know what? You know what happened there. It was, it was kind of amazing. Uh, the line before that, he, he God says he's leaving. Uh, John Denver's side, and he said, I, he said, I think I'm going to spend some time with the animals. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe I'll have a run luck with them. And as he said that, this was totally unplanned, unprepared, uh, just really very spooky. A dog walked by. We were shooting it in a public park, and a dog walked by in the background as though someone had cued him to come in on that line. <laughs> it was just astonishing. I get chills when I think of that. <laughs> I really do. When you, uh, you know, and all this came out before we heard about all this uh, television evangelism uh, business, you know, in the, in the... Well, we had it then. We, we had, had it, then. but we didn't have all the uh, scandal going on. Well, the exposés. No, we didn't. No. Uh, but I'll tell you, that movie probably did more for me as far as making me think that there has to be somebody in charge yes. than a lot of the other stuff that I've heard throughout my life. I just thought it was just brilliant writing. Well, thank you very much. It, 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 thank you. I, I mean, it's... Um... I think the simplicity of it is what worked so well. Yeah, but I was always wondering how you were going to end it. How would you bring that back around? And that, that final line then, man, that just, just gets you. Oh, thank you very put, much. Put you back into uh, a condition where you can leave the theater. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> not, not, not something that happens every day. Right. Larry Gelbart is a guy who's got the book out. Laughing Matters. You, you talk about writing MASH, Tootsie, uh, Oh God few other funny things, quite a few other funny things. Thank you. Um, they say comedy is very serious business. Uh, are you, are you, a, you, you seem to be a very uh, well, I think well, the, a funny I think guy, the, I mean, just in general. But, uh, well, how, I think the trick is, uh, is to write comedy about serious matters, about serious business. Um, uh, it's, uh, it, it's not serious insofar as I, I'm sitting here, you know, with my brow all wrinkled. I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know say certain things in a, in a way that, that uh, you know, make make these ideas palatable to people. Mm -hmm. um, but but life is serious. You know, the whole purpose of, of comedy is to kind of deny that fact, really. Right. We'd be pretty upset if we went to somebody like a doctor and all they could do is laugh at us. I mean... I think so. <laughs> I'd get a second opinion <laughs> or a second laugh from somebody. But we do need that break. Do you think we've gone a little comedy crazy for a while? The comedy clubs that sprung up all around the country were... Uh, um, I think I say in the book, I, people used to wonder where all the comedians are coming, the new ones are coming from, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm hoping they'll all go back to wherever they did come from. Yeah, uh, it just yeah, I think there's a glut right now. Do you think we've pushed the envelope too far? I mean, that's part of comedy, though, make to exaggerate and make things bigger than life. And well, I mean, yeah. I've heard some criticism. You know, they're picking on the president constantly, and and all this. Uh, and look at our and look at our morals. You know, people who are concerned about that stuff. What, what, what's your take? Well, on comedy that? doesn't create the morals. Comedy comments on the morals. Mm -hmm. And I think we're living in very, very uh, tough times, meaner times, unpleasant times. And they, and I believe the comedy reflects that. You know, right? Can we ever bring it back? Do you think? Swing it back the other way a little bit. Well, I guess if the world gets a little nicer, and that's kind of <laughs> now I'm being Pollyannish, uh, we could swing back. But I, I think uh, we've just been we've just been brutalized in, in a certain way and and uh, desensitized. And it, it, I, for one, find it very hard to believe that we can ever get back to you know it's a wonderful life kind of life. Right. I just wonder if we'll get to the point though. Instead of the F word, if somebody utters "golly." Or shucks, that will put people on the floor again because it's so different. <laughs> that I wouldn't wait for. <laughs> the uh, the book is Laughing Matters. We have about a minute here. What uh, what do you want to mention? I've I've steered you in all sorts of directions. And oh, I'm, I'm 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 fine. I'm fine. Be I'm I'm happy being steered. Really. Are you? Yep. Dustin Hoffman in a dress for Tootsie. I mean, you you couldn't wait to see him dress up like that, could you? Uh, only on the screen. In real life, I can wait forever. <laughs> 
I, no, I, I knew I knew that that it, you know, smelled like uh, creative and uh, and commercial success. Yeah, there's one line in the book here. It's in the preface that Alan Alda wrote, and I think it's great. Um, he's describing you. He says, if something in the script didn't seem to work, you would ride over to the stage from your office on a bicycle. You'd listen to the problem. Then you'd do the strange thing. You'd stand with your face against the wall, and in about 30 seconds, a piece of dialogue would come to you. He claimed there was a little old man who actually wrote this stuff, and this was how he communicated with him. After well, Larry left, we missed him, especially those of us who wrote for the show. But the fact is, no matter how long you stand facing the wall, the little old man prefers talking to Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the ultimate compliment he can pay you. I guess so. But, but being Jewish, uh, I'm used to going to the wall for solutions. <laughs> oh, I like that. You don't, you don't do any wailing while you're there, though, do you? Uh, if, if I don't get an answer, I do. <laughs> do you? Hey, listen, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure to talk to you, Ken. Uh, Larry Gelbart, uh, author of Laughing Matters. It's a Random House publication. You got anything else in the work? You're not, you're not uh, going to retire, are you? You're just going to keep working? I'm going to work until I'm unalterably interrupted. <laughs> I- I'm working on a screenplay uh, based on the musical, uh, uh, the stage musical Chicago right now. We're supposed to go into rehearsal and, and, and production uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the fall. Okay. L- one last question. Yep. When you get to the... you ever have a writer's block? No, I, can't, I haven't got time for a writer's block. Never happens to you? I mean, people are waiting for pages. I, I can't... <laughs> I so, can't indulge myself. So a deadline a deadline works. A deadline works. And, in fact, yeah. it worked for MASH, I guess. You were over in England, weren't you, at the time? And I wrote the pilot over in, in England. I, I wrote the show, of course, on the 20th Century Fox, Fox yeah. lot right here in Hollywood. But you told them that it had already been sent. You hadn't written it yet. Uh, when I yes, I, I I had promised it by a certain date, and the <laughs> producer called and said, "How's it coming?" And I said, "I just mailed it." And at that point, I knew I had to go home and write it. And so it took me a couple of days. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you, <laughs> Larry. All the best to you. Thank you for being on. Thank you, Ken.